studying our theme, which is um, the, uh, the adequacy of the Spirit for spiritual victory, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Um, and we're going to look at this uh, brief outline uh, about this chapter. It says, verses 1 through 17, our deliverance from the flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, our final deliverance will be when our flesh is done away with, right? And we're, we have a resurrected body, but while we still have this mortal body, we can still deal with the flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by the law. We saw what happens when we try to please God by, by simply obedience to the law, by simply knowing what God wants from us. That leads to frustration, uh, chapter 7 of Romans. In chapter 8, we see that the only way that we can overcome our flesh is by the power of the Spirit. Okay? So, verses 1 through 7, our deliverance from the flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verses 1 through 4, the believer's condition. What is the believer's condition? Well, Verse 1 says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, and then verse 2, so, so thanks to, to, to the fact that we are in Christ Jesus, there is no, therefore no condemnation. And then verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So thanks to the law of the Spirit, which I think is a reference to God the Holy Spirit, we are set free from the law of sin and death. We have been transferred from our position in Adam to our position in Christ Jesus. So in verse 1, we see the work of Christ Jesus that sets us free from condemnation. And then in verse 2, we see the work of the Holy Spirit who sets us free from the law of sin and death. And then verse 4, we'll see the work of God the Father in setting us free from condemnation and from the law of sin and death. Verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, the law could not set us free from sin and death. It could only point to our, our guilt. Weak as it was through the flesh, God... God the Father, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh. Okay, so we see here the Trinity, the work of Christ that set us free from, from all condemnation. Those who are in Christ are set free from condemnation. And then it's the, the work of God the Holy Spirit who sets us free from the law of sin and death. And then in verse 3, we see, we see that it's God, God the Father, who sent His Son in likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin to condemn sin in the flesh. So thanks to God the Father who sent His Son that we have freedom from condemnation. We have freedom from condemnation. So definitely, remember in, in Romans chapter 1, it says the gospel of God. It starts with that, you know, the gospel of God. The good news starts with God. It doesn't start with us. It starts with God. What we, pre, what we bring to the transaction is our need, our need of God. But we're set free from condemnation through, 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 through Jesus Christ, through the work of the Holy Spirit, and through the work of God the Father. In verse 4, so, the, the, so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen. That is our condition. We are set free from condemnation, and now we have the, the uh, walking in righteousness is a possibility that is given to us as believers. We have that possibility. There is that possibility. Um, uh, and, and the requirement is that we have got the Holy Spirit indwelling us, but the, and also that we are walk according to the Spirit, that we yield to the Holy Spirit, that we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, that we let Him 
direct our life. So that is our condition. And then verses 5 through 11, we saw the contrast between the flesh and the spirit. And I believe that this contrast is between two lifestyles that are available to the believer at any moment. You know, we could be walking by the spirit consistently, consistently, and that's called maturity. But, you know, the flesh is always there. It's always there. And we can, we can um, unfortunately, we can slip and fall prey to the flesh. So, as, so in verses 5 through 11, there's a contrast between the spirit and the flesh. And it makes no sense to live according to the flesh because we know what the flesh brings. It brings death. And we know, so it only makes sense for us as believers to yield our will to the control of the Holy Spirit uh, be, because uh, it's consistent with who we are in Christ and it brings life. The Spirit brings life, brings life. So that's verses 5 through, through 11. Let's go ahead and read them. Just We'll read right through all, to, right, uh, all of these verses together. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh. You are not an unbeliever, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So a believer can walk according to the flesh, but he is not in the flesh. Okay, um, And we as believers, we are all indwelled by the Holy Spirit. There's no such thing as a believer who is not indwelled by God, the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, which he is, though the body is dead because of sin, which is also true, our body is, is I think it's referring to this mortal body, is dead because of sin, um, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. That's who we are as Christians. I'm sorry that I'm going to pause here. But that's who we are in Christian, as Christians. We, we're a new person, but we still have an old body. A body that is still prone to sin. That is still uh, sold unto sin. So um, that, that's who we are. That's who we are. Verse 10 again. If Christ is in you. And that is true. So we have Christ dwelling in us. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. But the body is still dead because of sin. So we still have this body that drags us to do those things that are, are not pleasing to God. Yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful. But we'll see today that even though this is true, that the Spirit is alive because of righteousness, we are still longing for the day when we finally have our, our total and complete redemption. Well, you know, we, we're still ha waiting for that day when we have our final redemption. Okay, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the, from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you in you what is the guarantee of our resurrection the spirit uh, ephesians says that we were sealed with the spirit unto the day of redemption so how do you know that there's life after death have we seen it has anybody experienced it no we know because we have the holy spirit dwelling in us and we'll see later on in today's bible study that that it's the first fruit the first fruit of our inheritance is the Spirit of God dwelling in us. And the first fruit is a celebration that, was, that the, the Jews had uh, saying the whole harvest belongs to God. It's saying there's more to come. There's more to come. So we know that there's more to come, the resurrection of our body, because we have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in us now. Praise God for that. And that is wonderful news. Verse 12, 
So then, okay, what's the, why, what's the conclusion of everything that we've been dealing with, the, the flesh and the, and, the, and the spirit? Well, brethren, so then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh. You know, we, have, we are not under any obligation to the flesh to live according to the flesh, but we're, but we're, oblig, we're under obligation to the spirit. I think that's what he's, he, he's going to say further on. But if you are living according to the flesh, you are dying. You are dying. You know, to live according to the flesh, we know what that means. The fruit of the Spirit is envy, jealousy, strife, all those things that are listed in Galatians chapter 5. Wouldn't we agree that all, that thing, all those things bring death? All that envy, jealousy, all that. That's what, what living according to the flesh is. All those things bring one thing, and that is death. Um, death to relationships, personal relationships, uh, to oneself, you know, psychological issues, because you're not at peace with yourself. You're not at, at peace with God. You know, uh, so to live according to the flesh brings uh, death, separation. But if by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, you are putting to death, to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And that's, I think, where we ended up last, last week. So we mortify the body uh, by, the, by the Spirit, by the Spirit. It's, it's in the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's the Spirit doing the, the, uh, the overcoming, but we have to yield to the Spirit. We have to yield. We have to say, God, not, let it, let, not my will be done, but your will be done. I think Jesus is a great example of what it means to mortify the, the, the body um, and to, to, to yield to the spirit and not to our sinful flesh. Okay, so it's mortifying the body is something that's done in the power of the Holy Spirit, but it must be done by us. We must, be, we must yield. We must want to please God more than we want to please ourselves. And that's the daily struggle that we all go through. We must want to please God more than uh, ourselves. But that's not enough, just wanting to please God. We must rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. And is the power of the Holy Spirit there always available to us? I think it's always available to us. Yeah, uh, so it's not, it's not that the Holy Spirit is not there. It's that, you know, we're not always willing to let the Spirit of God control our lives, to lead us. All those who are of, 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 of God are led by the Spirit, are directed by the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, is directing us, but we must yield, okay, if we're going to mortify the body. Verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Amen. All believers are led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, we're led by the Holy Spirit through His Word. I think that it, when, we, when we read the Word of God, when we study the Word of God, that's, God uses that to lead us. So brief, verses 14 through 17 explains the Spirit's ministry of confirming the reality of the believer's position as a son of God. To him or her, to him or her. Paul believes that the believer who is aware of his or her secure position will be more effective in controlling his or her flesh. So verses 14 through 17 explains the spirit, the spirit ministry in confirming the reality of the believer's position as a son of God. So let's read these verses. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God... These are the sons of God. So there, there's the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the believer, letting us know that we are his children. And he lets us know that we are his children by leading us, by leading us, by directing us. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. Okay, so on the one hand, we have fear. 
And on the other hand, we have intimacy, uh, a closeness, where we call God uh, Abba, or we, uh, we call God Abba, Father. Uh, so if someone is living according to the Spirit, he will have this closeness to God. There's this closeness to him to the point that we can call him Father, Father, Dear Father. Um, uh, it's a term of, 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 uh, of, ad, of worship, and it's a, it's a ter- Abba Father is a term of, of intimacy, closeness. Okay, so if a, person is, if, as a, if a person is living according to the Spirit, will he have the witness of God the Holy Spirit in him, affirming him as a believer? Yes. You, I know I am a believer because I have believed the Bible. I have the witness of God, the Holy Spirit. But as I walk in obedience to the Spirit, then the, the fruit of that uh, results in further assurance that I'm a child of God. It results in further assurance of who I am in Christ Jesus. Okay? So being led by the Spirit uh, affirms that we are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery. Where does the, the spirit of slavery lead to? Fear. You know, the word fear appears for the first time in Genesis when, when, when Adam said, I heard your voice and I was afraid. Where does fear come from? It comes from knowing that we have done wrong. And, and fear is an emotion. It, it's a state of mind. That brings depression, that brings anxiety. So uh, a person that is in disobedience receives the, the, the fruit of his disobedience, which is fear. And a person who is in obedience to God, he also receives the, uh, that, that assurance of salvation uh, because of the, the intimacy that he has with God. Okay? We have peace with God just because we have believed in Him. Our, our condemnation has been removed. But as we walk in, in the Spirit, as we're led by the Spirit, and we're, then we experience the peace of God. We have uh, experiential peace with God. Okay? Uh, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also... Heirs of God and follow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. So verses 14 through 17 explains the Spirit's ministry of confirming the reality of the believer's position as a son of God to him or her. Okay. Uh, It's kind of confirming that it's subjective. I know there's the objective confirming that we are God's children. We go to the Bible. That's how we know that we're God's children because we we have God's word that says if you believe in him, you have eternal life. But but I think there's also a subjective confirming uh, by the Holy Spirit that we're his children when we are walking in obedience. We're walking in obedience. And I think that's what these verses deal with. Okay. To be led by the Spirit, Spirit probably means to have, a, to have the direction of one's life as a whole determined by the Spirit. Again, uh, being led by the Spirit, this term probably means to have the direction of one's life as a whole determined by the Spirit. So when we make decisions, we look to God, the Holy Spirit, to direct our lives, to direct our lives. And that's why sometimes we don't know how to pray because even though we know what we support, we're supposed to pray, we have the Lord's Prayer that, that talks about, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, hallowed be thy name. You know, it focuses first, first on God and his glory. And, 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 and then, there, then there's another part of prayer which, de- which deals with our personal needs. Give us this day our daily bread. And so we're to pray also to pray for for our, our physical needs as well as our spiritual needs. And then, uh, and so we know how, we have an idea of what we're supposed to pray for, like a general term of what we're supposed to pray for. But when, when it comes to praying for direction in particular areas of our, of our lives, 
we sometimes don't know how to pray in, the, in that situation. But that's when God the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. But the point is that we should be looking to God the Holy Spirit to direct and determine every decision that we make. Every decision that we make. Is God, which, will this glorify you? Will this bring opportunities for ministry? Well, will this be something that will result in, in my growth? And will I be able to reach out to people if I make this decision? Uh, will your name be glorified with this decision? Or will it cause for your name to be uh, blasphemed? Uh, uh, so we look to God, the Holy Spirit, for direction. Again, to be led by the Spirit probably means to have the direction of one's life as a whole determined by the Spirit. What a wonderful way to live. What a wonderful way to live. Even Jesus, when he was going to, to, the, to Calvary, he still went to, to, to Gethsemane and prayed. He knew what he needed to do, but he still went and, and talked with his father. What, that, that's just a beautiful example of what it means to be led by the Spirit. So after, believing, after believers come to Christ, the Holy Spirit continues to lead them in, in the mortal will of God. The Holy Spirit leads every true, true child of God, Galatians 5, 18. He goes before them and expects them to follow him like a shepherd expects his sheep to follow him. However, we can choose to follow or not follow our shepherd to walk according to the spirit or to walk according to the flesh. Verse 13 of Romans chapter 8 told us this. The spirit leads us objectively through the scripture and subjectively by his internal promptings and providential guidance. And some people don't agree with this. You know, some people just go, you know, with the guidance being objective. You know, we just go to the Word of God. We don't pay attention to our feelings or to our inner promptings. Uh, we don't look at the, those subjective leading of the Holy Spirit. We just look to the Word of God. And that's fine. But I think that if you have the Holy Spirit in you and you call God Abba Father, it will affect the way you, you feel. It will affect your emotions. It will affect you. You know that you're a child of God. I think that's why I've been singing that song. You ask me why I know he lives, uh, you know, because he lives in my heart. Well, yeah, I know he lives because the Bible says it, but also because he lives within my heart. That's subjective. That is subjective. But it's very real if you've experienced it. <laughs> okay, so just something to think about. All right, Galatians 4, 6. Look at this. Because you are sons, and we are, we're all believers are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Would you know about that? Would you? Of course. I think if you have the Holy Spirit living in you, and the spirit is crying, Abba, Father, that, that's going to affect you. You're, you're just going to know that you are a son, a son of God. Okay. First John, First John, uh, chapter three, verse twenty-four. First John three twenty-four, the who, the one who keeps his commandments and and abides in him, and he and he in him, we know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So we know by this that he abides in us. By the Spirit whom He has given us. So I think that the Holy Spirit does uh, communicate to our spirit that we are God's children. There's, there's something that happens in us that, um, that we can say, hey, I know that I have believed. I know that I am God's child because I have the, the Holy Spirit of God living in me who cries, Abba, Father. Okay, so let's go back to... Romans chapter 8, 15, the leading of the Holy Spirit.
For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as son by which we cry, Abba, Father. <clears throat> Instead of cowarding in slave-like fear, Christians can approach God in an intimate way, calling him Abba, Father. So I want you to contrast, the, notice that contrast, fear on one end, and then Abba, Father, on the other end. Uh, there's no need for us to live as slaves uh, under fear. Uh, but when we can approach God in an intimate way, calling him Abba, Father. What would cause a Christian to live as a slave and under fear? Disobedience. The sin always leads to uh, enslavement and to fear but we can in the spirit of God know the intimacy that comes uh, where we can call God Abba Father but we must be led by the spirit and follow the leading of the spirit for this to happen verse 16 the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God Dr. Moo says on this verse Commenting on this verse, Paul stresses that our awareness of God as Father comes not from rational consideration nor from external testimony alone, but from a truth deeply felt and intensely experienced. If some Christians err in basing their assurance of salvation on feelings alone, and that is an error to base your assurance of salvation on feelings alone, Many others err in basing it on facts and arguments alone. Indeed, what Paul says here calls into question whether one can have a genuine experience of God's spirit of adoption without it affecting the emotions. I think one thing will affect the other. If you have God, the Holy Spirit, um, living in you, it will affect your emotions it will affect your, 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 uh, your way of thinking. You will know in your spirit that you are a child of God. Okay? And I said, Dr. Moose said that because I know that it's a, some people disagree with that. They just, well, you know, I just go by what the word says and that's it. You know, I don't need to have that, that internal testimony of God, the Holy Spirit. And that's fine too. All right. I like both. <laughs> I like to look to the scriptures, but I also believe that if you are really a child of God, it will affect the way you, you feel your emotions. You'll be excited about God. You'll be excited about God. It, that's, not a, that's not bad, right, to be excited about God? We get excited about baseball. <laughs> we get excited about all these other things. Why not get excited about God, you know, and what, who he is and, what he's, and that we are now his temple Temples of the God, the Holy Spirit. Okay, very well. Um, so Dr. Hodges holds a different position. He's like, no, it's just by the word of God. We don't go on feelings, and that's fine too. Zane Hodges will hold that position. All right, very good. So then we continue. Verse 17, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and, fo and follow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Okay. Um, verse 17. Being adopted children of God makes us his heirs. Adoption. Okay. Uh, it makes us his heirs. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. 
So if you're a child of God, you are an heir of God. You are an heir of God. Not least of importance in the concept of sonship is the fact that it links into the theme of inheritance. Not unnaturally, since the primary purpose of adoption was to provide a suitable heir. We inherit along with Christ, with along with Jesus Christ, our, our brother. Verse 29. Jesus Christ is our brother. We inherit both sufferings now. Praise God for that inheritance, right? We're to glory, glory in suffering. That's part of our inheritance. Uh, we inherit both sufferings now as his disciples and glory, most of which lies in the future. That is our inheritance, is to suffer for him now and to uh, and future glory. And future glory. I don't know if there's... So anyways, I, I think that, uh, yes, we can rejoice in suffering and we can rejoice in the glory that awaits us first peter 4 13 so we are children of god uh, we are heirs and our inheritance includes suffering and glory first peter 4 13 but but to the degree that you share the sufferings of christ what Keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. So there's rejoicing now and there's also rejoicing in the future. Uh, there's rejoicing now in suffering because as we have seen in Romans chapter 5, suffering is a tool that God uses, us, uses to perfect us. It's the way that, we will, that God will use to mature us. Uh, and so we can praise God even in our suffering. It reminds us that this is not our home. Our home is in heaven. Um, so, uh, and when we lose material goods, it reminds us that everything is vanity. Everything is perishing. So it helps us put our perspective in God. It's, it's, a, it's a tool for, for us. Uh, and so you remember even Paul suffered and he asked God to relieve him from this suffering. And God said, no, I'm not because my, my power is perfected in your weakness. I'm going to use that um, uh, aguijon, uh, that, that, um, that suffering that you have, I'm going to use it so that it can keep you humble. So it can keep. So you can become. You can continue to be a, a useful instrument. So, so God, God, God has given us the blessing, the inheritance of suffering for Him now as His disciples. Once again, First Peter four thirteen. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exaltation. Let's look at our 1 Peter 4.13. I think well, that's the one we just read right now. 1 Peter 4.13. Very good. So uh, 1, 1 Peter 4.12. Mm, let's, let's just back up in, in verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which come upon you for your testing as though some strange things were happening to you. Okay, so we should not be surprised when we suffer, especially when we're doing the will of God. It, it's, you know, the human mind can play games with us. We could say, how is it possible for a person to be doing the will of God and then have a, a stroke or, you know, or, or a case of, of our pastor you know, have this terrible uh, issue, health issue. You know, he's doing the will of God. Uh, well, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. Um, it's not that God is not in control. Um, it's that 
He has his purposes and he has his plans. So suffering for Christ should be something that we should welcome. And then, of course, there is the future glory that awaits us as his children. The New Testament teaches that the amount of inheritance the children of God receive will vary depending on our faithfulness to God. Amen? Uh, the future inheritance is, is closely related with our suffering now uh, for Christ Jesus. And Peter says that we're not to suffer as evildoers. If you suffer for doing wrong, there's no glory in there. There's no inheritance in that. But if we suffer for doing what's right, then there's a co direct correlation between that and our future um, glory. And our future glory. Let's look at Luke 19. Luke 19. Now we're dealing with the theme of inheritance. And I, now I know why Pastor David can spend years and years on one letter. And that's because, you know, you get to a subject and you can expand on that subject and go on forever. But so right now we're dealing with uh, inheritance and, and future glory. Uh, Luke 19, verse 11. And since we ha it's only 355, we have a lot of time, so we can. <laughs> uh, Luke uh, 19. Uh, 11 through 27. Luke 19, 11 through 27. Okay. Okay, so it says, While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell the parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. And he said, A nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself, and then returned. So we see the context of this parable. Jesus is going away. He came to establish the kingdom. The, he was rejected, so God postponed the kingdom. And now he tells them this parable. I'm going to go away. Okay? And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minus and said to them, Do business with these until I come back. And I'm going to do the application right now. You know, So, so Christ is gone. So now we are those the ones that are that have been given these talents. And what are we supposed to do with these talents? We're supposed to work these talents uh, and, and do business with them until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that, they, that he might know what business they had done. The first appears saying, Master, your mina, ha your mina has made ten minus, minus more. And he said to them, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be in authority over ten cities. The sec second came saying, Your mina, Master, has made five minus. And he said to him also, And you are able, and you are to be over five cities. Another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Jesus was not very concerned with people's feelings, right? He just, worthless slave. <laughs> You did not, you didn't, you buried your talent. You, you did not work for me while I was gone. Did you not, did you, did you know that I am an exacting man? Take up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow. Then why did you not put my money in the bank and having come, I would have it collected with interest. Then he said to the, Bystander, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from, from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine whom, who did not want 
me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. So there's a lot going on, but I think the point is that once the, the, the king leaves, he gives these minas and he expects for the people to work, to, to make these minas uh, grow. And I think that for us as believers, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be involved in the kingdom of God. And we're supposed to be involved in ministry. That's what we're supposed to be doing, ministry. I love this Sunday. I love the ministry that took place this Sunday with the fellowship. You know, everybody serving, everybody bringing things together, everybody eating. That's part of ministry, too. You got to eat what's there. Uh, so I did pretty good with that. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, helping clean up, all of that, you know, Mark and, and, and everybody just just pitched in and, 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 and it just made, made it a, a wonderful time of fellowship. And, and that's, that's, that's what ministry is about. We're a body. And one is an eye, one is an ear, one is a foot, one is a hand. And everybody has to do their function in order for the body to, to, uh, to be healthy, for the church to be healthy. But if I'm a hand and I don't do my job, then I, I, the body's not going to be healthy. So it, is it easy to serve? Just the word serve tells us it's not easy to serve. You've got to give of something. You've got to give of your time, your energy. Uh, and it's not easy, but there is a direct relationship between our suffering for Christ and our future glory, and our future glory. Is that important? Okay. <clears throat> so all regenerate men have God as their inheritance, or as Paul put it, our heirs of God, Romans 8, 17, Galatians 4, 7. Their heirship is received on the basis of only one work, the work of believing. So we are heirs of God just by the fact that we believe in him. Okay, But there is another inheritance in the New Testament, an inheritance which, like that of the Israelites, is merited. They are also heirs of the kingdom and they are also heirs of the kingdom and joint heirs with the Messiah. So the joint heir is, is a different inheritance that is given to those who already have an inheritance uh, and is given for suffering with Christ, suffering with Christ. So let's go back to uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Um, Seventeen, And if children, heirs, heirs also, heirs of God, and, follow, and fellow heirs with Christ. So we're all heirs of God, but I think there's a, a, an inheritance that is only for those who suffer with him. And that is the uh, co, uh, those are referred to as co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Okay, so there, there's an inheritance which is, a, is for all believers, and I think there's an inheritance that is given to those who suffer with him. And it has to do with our rewards. It has to do with rewards. Okay, so it's something to think about. Like I say, you, that's a theme in itself. Probably Pastor David would do a few lessons on just the doctrine of rewards. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to, re that is to be revealed to us. It says, verse 18, uh, Zane Hodges, I have a note from him, is, he says, in the light of eternity, we should view the cost of suffering with Jesus Christ now as insignificant, not worthy to be compared in view of the glory that lies ahead for us. 2 Corinthians 4.17. We'll read that. 
2 Corinthians 4, 17. So we're dealing now with the theme of suffering. So we went with, from the theme of the, the, the te in, inward testimony of God the Holy Spirit in the believer. We dealt with that. And now we're dealing with, uh, we dealt with heirship, uh, inheritance. And now we're going, moving on to another thing, which is suffering. So in light of eternity, our suffering sh should be viewed as insignificant, as insignificant. Second Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 17. For momentary light of for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Uh, what, how does he refer to our sufferings now? As momentary. It's momentary. Light affliction. And this light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. The children of God are therefore destined for a glorious liberty, which is certainly which certainly includes freedom from sin, that is the future glory that awaits us. Or that's the future inheritance that awaits us. It's freedom from sin, freedom from suffering, freedom from corruption and death. The New Testament scripture testifies to this ultimate freedom in many places, especially 1 Corinthians 15 verses 14. 42 through 58. Um, so let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. Our future glory, our future inheritance. 42. This is what is to keep us focused uh, so that we can endure the hardship that our present hardships, our present hardships. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 58. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body and it is raised an imperishable body. Praise God. That is the, this is a beautiful explanation of the resurrection. I think Pastor said it was one of the best exp explanations of the resurrection in the Bible. Uh, amen. We saw a perishable body, a weak body, a, a body that's full of infirmities, a perishable body. But it is raised an imperishable body. That's the future glory. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised, How? In glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So he goes from the known to the unknown. So how do we know that there's a spiritual body? Because we have a natural body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spirit is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthly. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthly, so also are those who are earth, earth, earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have bore the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perish perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on, the, put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, then this mortal will have put on immortality. Then will come about the saying that it is written, 
death is swallowed up in victory. That's when death will be totally put away. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory, not through the law, but through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, we be steadfast because we have this hope. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That is our future glory. And if we're going to uh, do well in, in the midst of suffering, we need to keep that in mind. What awaits us? What awaits us? The future glory that awaits us. And uh, praise God for the study that we, that we have um, in the book of Revelation where we see new heavens and new earth. That that's what awaits us. That's the future glory that awaits us as believers. So though we may have struggles, we may have afflictions, let's keep our eyes put on the glory that is to come. That is to come. Uh, so let's go back to uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 18. The theme of suffering. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation awaits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. We are sons of God. Uh, we are uh, heirs. Heirs. You know, children... In, in, the, in the Jewish thought, a child was no different from a slave. He, he was not able to, to participate in the inheritance of his father. But when the child became a son, he was now able to participate in the inheritance of his father. All believers are sons of God. We're able to participate in the uh, inheritance of that we have in Christ Jesus. The adult status possessed by all believers and experienced by, as they are led by the Spirit will be on full and glorious display at the coming of Christ. And that display will result in the liberation of creation itself from its bondage to corruption. When man sinned, he brought the creation under bondage. And when, when so man sinned, brought uh, corruption to the creation. And when the sons of God are revealed, it will bring freedom to creation. The curse will be lifted from creation. Uh, right now, it, we're, it, it's not in full display who we are because we're still covered in this body of sin. Um, but someday, it will be revealed like a statue when, when, it is, it's, when the, the veil is removed and you actually see the statue. So also someday our flesh will be removed, our mortal flesh, our body of sin will be removed, and then it will be revealed who we really are. We are a new creation. We are the children of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we know all these things. We already are temples of the Holy Spirit but we still have a body that, that kind of uh, bleaks that, that kind of covers that. But that veil will someday be removed and, it, and who we are in Christ will be on full display. On full display. Praise God for that. Okay, so we have a lot to, waiting for us as children of God. We have a lot waiting for us as children of God. Um, so... You know, we suffer a lot of time because of the curse that's put on, uh, on earth. A lot of our suffering is due to that. But someday the curse will also be lifted. Okay? Uh, so if you're suffering because of hurricanes or because of uh, ailments, physical body, that's part of that curse that was put on creation. That will be lifted. And I think that's where we're going to finish today. So next week, I was hoping to finish today, but next week we'll continue dealing with suffering, 
dealing with suffering. Is, I hope this is giving us a handle to, so when suffering comes our way, we're ready. It's, it'll be terrible for suffering to come and we don't, and, and, and not have tools to deal with it. it. It's best to have the tools ready so when it comes, it's like, I'm ready for this. I don't like it. Uh, in my, sin, my, my body, my, my, my nature might rebel against it, but I know, I know that I can handle this because I know what awaits me. And I can't even thank God for the suffering because it's part of, 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 of uh, the inherent, uh, inheritance that, that we have, especially if we suffer for Christ. So suffering is a very important theme. And I think that it covers from verse 18 to the end of this chapter, that the theme of suffering is covered in those chapters. There's, a, there's some verses that it's very hard to understand you know, where it talks about predestination and election and all that. What I, say, what I put there on my notes is, don't worry, God's in control. <laughs> God's in control. Okay, so now I, I, I don't know how all these doctrines play, play exactly, but all I know is that God is in control. And if you're suffering, does it help to know that God is in control? Amen. God is in control. So we'll, we'll deal with, I think, one more lesson, and um, we'll give Pastor David one more week of, to rest. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then we'll take it, we'll take it one, one step at a time. That's what he told me. He said, don't rush. So, okay, we'll do. All right, thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for giving us this wonderful blessing of knowing that we are your children. We know that you're, we're your children because your word says so. But we also know it because we have God, the Holy Spirit, living in, us, living in us, crying, Abba, Father. And Father, we also um, have the wonderful blessing of being heirs, heirs of God. And we have the, the blessing also of being co-heirs if we suffer with you. Help us to be faithful, God, in our service to you. Uh, while we're here on earth, so that when you come, you, we may hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And Lord, help us to also have a handle in, uh, in, in suffering, to understand that suffering is part of being, living in a world that has been cursed. But to also keep in mind what awaits us, the glory that awaits us, the day where we will be set free from sin, death, slavery, corruption yes father and may that hope keep us going uh, in this time of our sojourn journey here on earth oh we love you father and we thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to know you and to serve you we ask god that you would be with us the rest of this week uh, that you will protect us and god bring opportunities for us to minister your word to others and may you prepare the people that, that we meet so that uh, your word can be received and that it can flourish in their lives. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.